So what I would like to take you through today is basically a timeline, a 10 years timeline of my exposure um, and my involvement in sustainability. And um, it's not going to be just environmental sustainability. It's going to be a bit of social and economic, uh, economic sustainability as well as my project work. So as I was saying, I started, uh, I came to London in 2011, and that's when I joined SCD. It was supposed to be for one year and a half, and here I am, 10 years later, still here. Um, and this was me, and I, I was looking at this picture and I thought, that's really the age of innocence because when I came to London, this is pretty much all I knew about environmental design. And I know Sim, uh, Simos hated this set of diagrams with uh, PVs and uh, wind turbines and all that, but that was where I started. And after that, obviously, we started doing teamwork um, and I had a great team of, um, of students uh, that I was working with. And actually, the way we started is me being the called the human ecotech because we didn't manage to get the ecotech work, working. And basically, I hand draw all the shadows in AutoCAD, uh, which Simon eventually noticed and he caught us on it. Anyway, that was the beginning. Um, and eventually, I became the anal analytic one of the team. I loved thermal modeling and I loved doing tasks, which is so unexpected if I think back well, of when I started. And I think that was triggered at some level, at some point in June in 2012, when I had a mini revelation, let's call it. Um, and we were actually in the, in the studio and it was a beautiful summer day. Um, you know, pretty much everything was perfect. You had uh, a bit of sunlight in the room, cross ventilation, really gentle breeze, humidity at the perfect level. Daylight at the perfect level, temperature, we were just feeling content. Simos was smiling a lot that day. Um, and I actually realized that it's not, so environmental design is not only about energy efficiency, it's actually about comfort and the joy that that brings to people. And I understood that sustainable environmental design, there's a subtlety to it and a sophistication to it, which I really, really was drawn to it. And that I think dro uh, drove me to what I studied further and my focus on thermal comfort and thermal modeling. And yeah, I had some early signs of a long-term obsession. I started obsessing over density and urban form and how that works in terms of sustainability. Can you actually achieve daylight and sunlight when you build in really dense environments? And that was uh, what my dissertation was focused on. And that was in Bucharest, Romania, where the, uh, I'm from. And it's quite interesting because the climate there Get, get really cold in winter, but it has a really strong sunshine. So kind of triggered um, the studies that I did afterwards about sun spaces and sun catches. Um, and this is an extract of a paper that I did in collaboration with Simos for Priya 2015. Um, and it was all about how you can use certain devices to, as tools for adaptive comfort really, and how you, can you adjust them through the year. And I'm sure you're quite familiar with these things by now. But obviously behind that, there was a lot of hard work and determination that helped us get through. And these are some pictures of our team sessions, <laughs> let's call them, um, more, and more, more or less studios, let's say. Um, so I just think back and I, I'm, I think with, with kind of great joy and, um, and kind of thankfulness for that period because it taught me a lot of things. But if we move on to... My professional work at PRP, um, I started working there in 2013, just after graduating for the EMARC. Um, and I'm still working there now. Um, and PRP, for those of you who don't know it, is a um, mainly UK-based practice um, in London, in Surrey, Manchester, um, and is one of the leaders in terms of housing specialism, urban regeneration, and affordable housing design. So it's mainly focused on residential from that point of view. But it also has sustainability, which really attracted me to it, um, a landscape and BIM and so on. But really the area that I, I eventually, the team that I eventually uh, started working in was focused on urban regeneration, which was very much related to the master's uh, dissertation that I, that I was looking at and also affordable housing. I'm really passionate about social sustainability. So it came at the, it, it, it basically ended up being a very good fit for me. So I would like you to take you through a couple of things. Um, one is a project that I've been working on for about five to six years, which is a regeneration master plan. Um, and these type of projects are really, really complex because you work with an existing community with existing buildings. 
Uh, so it's not as easy as starting from scratch on an empty site. And um, we have to take quite a few things in consideration. So I'll take you through this. And after that, I would like you to show a few examples of um, home typologies that we're now designing. So in terms of urban design, this is um, the existing site. It's called High Path Estate. It's in Southwest London, close to Wimbledon, if you're familiar with it. Um, and it's basically an estate that has built over four decades with very different types of buildings, not the greatest quality, I would say. Heights vary between two to 12 stories, actually. Um, the quality of the, the walls is not great. Um, and we obviously went through the usual process of site analysis to understand what are the opportunities for the site. Um, and something that is very specific to estates, and basically these are mostly accommodating social and affordable housing for the time, is that they act as, as an island. So they don't really interact with the surroundings. And because of that, there's almost like a stigma associated with them, which is not great. Um, also in terms of open space, interestingly, the way this were developed was almost through the modernist principles of the pavilion blocks. So you have loads of open space, but it's not really defined. It's not associated with public or semi-public, and it ends up just not being used at all. And something quite interesting in terms of density and urban form, which was my focus beforehand, was to understand that actually the density of the site was really low for an urban environment, it was 85 dwellings per hectare. Um, and it, I was quite surprised to find that, especially given the height of the buildings on site. And um, looking to the north, it's a very traditional Victorian terrace, um, ter series of terrace houses of three stories. And the density to the north was much greater than the one on the estate. So we found that was quite interesting in terms of perceived density. And that's a very hot topic generally with the communities that we work with. Um, and what we do when we start working on this type of projects is almost a options appraisal from a sustainability point of view, but also from a social point of view and a viability point of view. Um, and these are the uh, kind of options that we're looking for, so just a light touch retrofit, um, business as usual, which basically means that we, um, you would basically continue as you are. And um, many of these buildings are owned by housing associations We basically need to maintain the building. So these things become really, really expensive for the time to maintain. Um, and aside from that, we would be also looking at um, a combination of hybrid a solution between regeneration and retrofitting, which means some of the new build would pay for the retrofit of the existing buildings. And then obviously total regeneration as well. Um, and I was quite surprised to see that if we look at a, almost like a 60 year timeline, eventually if you look to the left hand side, the darker green is a total regeneration. In terms of carbon emissions, long term, it still makes more sense just because of the kind of the type of quality of the existing buildings in this site. So that was a surprise for me when we did this study. Um, and I was saying, because we work with local communities, community engagement is really important. Um, and on this project in particular, we did uh, loads of community engagement workshops, events um, with a local school, uh, but also with the residents to understand what type of solution will work best for them. Um, and this is just taking through the design principles from an urban design perspective. So the first thing we wanted to do is basically eliminate this um, kind of stigma and isolation of the site. Um, and we looked at reconnecting the neighborhood with a, with a wider context. We also introduced a central park. So basically what I was saying earlier about the open space is just bring them all together into one site. And that basically makes the site a destination is no longer isolated. And also rethinking the Victorian block, which seemed to be a very efficient way of occupying land. And perhaps uh, rather than having a very long block, it's just breaking that in the middle to provide more permeability. And that was the illustrative master plan that we came to probably after about two years of community engagement. And these were uh, basically the aspirations in terms of sustainability, the, uh, the higher level sustainability objectives. And I would say in terms of scope of influence from our team, um, it was mainly the areas that are highlighted here. 
So we looked at passive design principles, uh, social value from uh, you know the typologist's point of view, home typologist's point of view, um, uh, basically providing an environment for multi-generational communities, which is really important. The environmental quality that will be fitting into the health and well-being for the people. And also circular thinking, circular economy is becoming very um, present in discussions with the local authority. <clears throat> and um, part of that, it's obviously we are, our specialist team was helping us in terms of the vertical sky component, but also the overshadowing studies. I would say the sun path analysis at this stage, because we mainly work in in the UK, we're more or less familiar with how we should be, kind of the heights and the massing and the layout that works. And as I was saying, uh, social value and uh, social sustainability was very important. That was basically driven in the project through the delivery of uh, an intergenerational master plan um, that had fully integrated communities. Because the issue when you regenerate a site is that you have to densify basically to pay for, for the new buildings. Um, and that means the existing community feels a little bit um, threatened by the new private homes that are coming through. Um, so just ensuring that you create a platform for interaction and cohesion is really, really important. So if we move into building design, um, this was actually a project that I was running. So this part of the site we've um, submitted for, and it was approved in 2019, I believe, or 18. And um, there were a few elements that we agreed from the beginning with the client, aside from the BIM delivery, which is almost a, a standard um, now in the UK. It was also a, a standardized approach to elements, uh, and that basically int integrates bathroom pods, uh, standardized kitchens, utility pods, and also creating the digital the digital twin, uh, twin of, the, um, of the buildings. And that really enables our clients, which many times are housing associations, which need to maintain long-term the buildings to have a much more transparent relationship with the building and understand how it's performing. And that also means from a circular economy point of view that you reduce waste as much as possible rather than producing things on site. Uh, and a toolkit um, that we will work with also in terms of overheating, it's almost uh, identifying very early doors through a series of um, almost elements that could impact on the uh, risk to overheating, for example. So we would do a mapping of all the dwellings that we we'll propose and those that were higher risk, we would identify what are the mitigation measures from very early days. Um, and obviously we looked, uh, we still look at uh, cross ventilation and dual aspect and so on. But interestingly, that's not always possible when you have to work with higher densities. Um, but what I would say in terms of that is that more and more policies coming through the UK that actually forces developers and forces architects to, def uh, to design more uh, smartly and integrate all aspects a lot more than before. Um, so this describes the layout principles of the block that we were looking at earlier. Because we, we were designing for quite vulnerable residents, so elderly residents that needed a lot of uh, clarity in terms of direction, legibility of spaces, uh, you could see that there's a direct link between entrances and landscape courtyards. And on the upper levels, uh, we have large entrance areas in front of apartments used to the park to the left, used to the courtyard to the right. So there's always a connection with the outside. Um, you're not creating really kind of oppressing environments for them. And this was uh, almost like a family of buildings, family of uh, characters that we put together. And it was really important not to for us from an urban design point of view, an architectural point of view, not to create a, a, a development that looks like it was just put there and day one, and just to introduce variety through time. And this is a view of a building that is at the very corner of the neighborhood park. Um, and this is fully social housing. What was really important for us is almost eliminating of what social housing can look like, um, which is quite a strong view in London, I would say. And for us, that was almost the, the, the biggest achievement, the quality that you should be delivering from day one for affordable housing and social housing. Uh, and these are illustrations of the same buildings from outside. So to the left-hand side, you can see the park and also internal illustrations of how this would look like from uh, inside one of the homes. 
and the same level of care we try to put into to the design of the communal areas. As I was saying, she always have this connect with the landscape, uh, but also you have sunlight and daylight into your communal entrance. It gives a sense of uh, pride to the residents at the same time. And same here. Uh, and we also had smaller, uh, we had the same approach basically also for the smaller homes. These were three-story houses for existing residents, which were provided as reprovision to their existing homes. Um, something that came through, through engagement with them is the flexibility of the living kitchen dining space. Uh, some people wanted to combine them in different ways, so basically we allowed for this kind of dual aspect space that could be um, split in different ways by them. And this was a street view where you can see we took some of the elements in the local character uh, to ensure there's a cohesive approach to the design. Um, and finally, before we move to the next steps, uh, this is a section about multi-generational homes. Uh, probably many of you are familiar with, with them, but it's basically something that uh, started a few years ago um, with one of our senior partners. Um, and the idea is to provide home typologies that cater for all different lifestyles, all different family structures, all different cultural backgrounds, um, and to provide that idea of choice. Um, and this is a multi-generational housing Choban Manor in the Olympic Park. So it's London, if you're familiar with it. Um, and the idea of the multi-gen house is basically providing accommodation for larger families to live together but separately. So to provide that element of independence uh, within the family members. And you can see here a section through that where you have uh, the main part of the house, which accommodates perhaps the parents and the children. And it's almost like a granny's annex uh, at the back or at the corner, which provides accommodation perhaps for a living nanny or living uh, grandparents. Um, and the space in between the court, that it's a space for interaction where the family comes together. Um, and it was really, really well received. And it seems like many more people are going towards that direction. Um, and from a, from a social sustainability point of view, it allows for that uh, social interaction, transfer of skills between generations, which is really important. Um, and also from an economical point of view, this space is completely independent. So if, for example, you have a, an adult child that moves away, they, the family can rent out the space and provide income, additional income for them. And this is actually the same house being built. And it was actually bought by the clients that developed the site. So yeah, they were really excited about this. And then what we looked at is how do we um, integrate the same principle in higher density uh, master plans where you don't necessarily have houses, but you have apartments or flats. Um, and this is a flat that we call the Flexi Family Multigen, uh, which very simply uh, putting it is joining two apartments together. So you have a, a three bedroom and a one bedroom flat that are joined through the amenity space. Um, and that amenity space becomes a multifunctional space that can be used for um, social gatherings. It can be used as a play area for the family. It just provides that uh, additional level of flexibility. And in a similar way, we also did the sharing family multi-generational flat would actually join together the, the homes into the center of the flat that becomes the heart of the home, uh, where uh, basically the family members can come together at times, but at the same time provides um, independence for the family and perhaps the grandparents or um, perhaps uh, uh, adult children that wants a little bit of uh, independence in the family. And uh, something that we, we are starting to promote more and more is also outdoor living and how through the quality of the amenity spaces and the connection between in, inside spaces and outside, you can promote that lifestyle that eventually leads to a, to a health and well-being, but also to a lower energy consumption. Uh, so what next? A few things. Um, I think from a policy timeline point of view, UK within the wider context is doing quite well in terms of taking those steps towards um, net zero carbon. And this is just, uh, I call it the unicorn timeline because it's so colorful. Um, but um, it, it's quite uh, hopeful to see that we're also the let targets in terms of carbon, um, operational carbon reductions. 
um, is looking at implementing it to 100% up to 2025. But obviously, there will have to be a stepped approach to that. And aside from that, I think it's important to understand where we are situated now, because obviously we've been through a few industrial revolutions, as we call them, but now we are living into a, the fourth industrial revolution, which is a cyber physical system and the Internet of Things, um, which I think we could actually use it to our advantage and we could make things more efficient in the way we design. So also in the terms of the uh, use of big data, that's something that we use regularly for social value mapping. Um, and that really leverages the way we analyze things and we implement things in a, in a very efficient uh, way that will make most impact. Generative design goals, we probably, you guys are probably working a lot more than I was 10 years ago with this, um, but it's all about uh, making use of toolkits and technologies to uh, provide a series of variation based on a very clearly set uh, of design objectives. Smart buildings, I was a little bit reluctant in the beginning about smart buildings, um, but I think there's a lot more to it that maybe comes to mind at the first glance. Aside from uh, kind of artificial intelligence, machine learning, the fact that the buildings can now um, predict some of our behavior, there's also the idea of the digital twin. Um, and I think that's really important going forward because it will allow us a much greater level of monitoring uh, post occupancy evaluation, but also things like, uh, you know, seeing what you have behind the wall is really practical for someone living in there to know where the pipes are going, whether they need, you can drill a hole through that. So I think th these are um, advancements that we should all kind of embrace going forward. We're also looking at smart, smart processes of construction. Um, and that's something we're really embracing in terms of modern methods of construction, modular design. Um, the way these are being put together, the fact that there is a lot less waste on sites, but also thinking about dismantling. So that idea of circular economy, what's going to happen when your buildings are no longer there. And I think that's something we think about very often working in urban regeneration and trying and hoping that we can use some of what the buildings have now. And we find it really difficult. And I also think in a way people are becoming smarter. Um, and COVID, COVID learning was a big, big sign of that. Um, I think people are starting to have very different objectives, very different um, aspirations for their lives, uh, whether that's in terms of health and well-being or expectations from what they should be getting from their buildings. Um, and we've seen, if you've been in London, you've probably seen how many people move out to London because they don't think it's offering the right lifestyle for them. Um, so I think these are all things that we should all be thinking about in the way we design to ensure that whether in a suburban or an urban environment, we do provide those uh, lifestyle qualities that people are searching for. And those are not at the cost of the climate, obviously. Uh, and I, I'm feeling really hopeful because I think the younger generation is already driving th that change and they're so adamant about it. And I think that's coming forward on different, in different domains. Um, and I think this is actually my last slide, and this is the march that we did to support the climate um, climate change uh, emergency. I think we all have a, a duty to support that, um, and whichever, I would say, whichever domain you choose to go to, just think about the area where you, and the way in which you could do the greatest impact, uh, because at the end of the day, we're all activists. I think that's the end of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you. Alexandra. Thank you. Um, we, we should find a bit of time for discussion, but maybe not now, maybe doing it at the end. Um, <clears throat> I think there's much to discuss. Um, now we'll, we'll continue the presentations with uh, Anelus. Are you? Ready there? Yes, I'm ready. I will share my screen and try to keep it a bit short. Yeah, it's showing. Okay. You just need to do full screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, it's done. Okay. Hi, 
I'm Anne Loes. Um, I graduated from SED in 2017. After that, I got a temporary job offer at uh, Tapman BDSP to be an environmental uh, consultant. And it was a nice opportunity to put into practice uh, all the aspects that we learned at SED because it's quite similar to the, the work that I did there as what, we, what we've learned during the course. Um, I started working there on a project that was a two kilometer long convention center in China. Shenzhen, also with Xiao Sheng, a former uh, student of, the, of SED and Hermann, which you may know. Um, and the white ribbon in the middle is a covered hallway where people could enter or go from one hall to the other uh, via, the outdoor, via an outdoor space. So a non-climatized space. And because Shenzhen is extremely humid and hot, uh, we had to apply a lot of shading facilities and also use that shading or the balance between open and closed space to uh, guide people along this, uh, this um, hallway. So I did a lot of grasshopper study scripts to, to find this optimum balance. Uh, very technical into deep, but a nice, yeah, a nice exercise. Um, after this project, I stayed a bit longer there and I did a few tenders in uh, different countries around the world, also different climates. And because I'm from the Netherlands, uh, that climate is quite similar to the UK. I didn't have any experience of how to design in different climates, going to China, but also uh, Nigeria, Spain. There are all these other environmental measures that you have to take into account other passive, uh, passive strategies. Um, so there was a very interesting, yeah, sort of side road that I took. Uh, after a while, I started missing, however, to, to design myself, to be an architect. Uh, so I started applying for architecture jobs, both in the UK and in the Netherlands. I got a job offer at uh, Paul de Ruiter Architects. They claim to be the most sustainable architectural practice in the Netherlands. They're also known for that. They do good PR. Uh, Paul, the, the owner, founder, did a PhD in the 90s uh, when sustainable design was not so good yet. Um, and he applied this, this kind of principles that we also learned at, at SED in his architectural work. So it seemed to be the perfect match for me. Um, these are a few examples of the buildings that he designed in the beginning of his career. Uh, you see that the facade is designed according to the orientation. They're quite innovative um, you know, product design elements that, that they did. So, for instance, this is an office building and they introduced a, a pattern of lamellas that are used to, to shape the building, but also can be opened from the inside and then you can natural, naturally ventilate the office. So that was quite innovative at that time. Um, he also did this hotel that you could close the wall basically when the hotel room is not occupied. Apparently 60% of the time a hotel room is not used and with all these glass you, you have a lot of heat loss. So uh, they invented this wall that you could close and you could basically close off the room. And it also gives this nice impression from the outside. You see which room is occupied. The building is constantly changing uh, and every facade is different. So these are the nice key projects that they do. But on the other hand, uh, they also do a lot of shitty, unsustainable, uh, uninteresting, 100% glass concrete buildings on several locations, such as facing the highway. And idealistic as I was, of course, when you do SED, you have ambition, you, are, you, have, yeah, you have some a vision on sustainability. I got into conflicts about this kind of project. But we did them, of course, to keep the office running. And I learned in that office that when the client has high ambitions, we would follow them. Um, and they were the, the special projects. But when the client did had, didn't have any ambitions, we also wouldn't put any effort in it. Um, and of course, you would want to try to push it to the maximum to force the client to be as sustainable as possible. And in the end, they, uh, they fired me because they said that um, 
there was a mismatch between their design approach and mine. So that was a bit harsh. Um, and I was a bit sad of that. But after that, I, I started applying for another job, of course, I had to. Um, and I ended up at uh, Bentham Trouw Architect. Maybe when you visited the Netherlands, maybe you know some of the buildings that we did. We do a lot of stations. And also we did a lot of for uh, Ripple Airport. Um, so this multimodal hub. This is Rotterdam Central Station. And this is the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, also called the Bathtub. Um, made of a composite facade. When I started working there two and a half years ago, uh, I worked on a lot of vendors. And uh, my first, one of the first ones that I worked on was um, an office building next to this office that we, that we completed in uh, Amsterdam for ING, I think. We just completed the office and uh, we were invited to do a tender for the plot next to it. Everyone was super happy with the result of this building, how it looked, very sleek facade, sharp edges, uh, very transparent and very sustainable, of course, um, with overhangs all around the building, vanishing in the north side where they are not needed. However, when I visited the site, I saw that all the blinds were down all the time, so not so transparent after all. Um, and this, you all, of course, know this because the facade is facing southwest, so when the afternoon sun hits the building, people will start to put the blinds down and my boss was really angry with this because he said, oh, whenever I'm driving or passing by this building, all the blinds are down and he said it would be very transparent. So uh, I, got, I collected all my courage and told him that it was because uh, he designed the facade according to the wrong orientation and that we should go different for this new tender that we were going to do next to this building. Uh, he took it rather well, so that was nice. And they asked me to... Uh, design the facades for the tender building in a sustainable way. So I, I gathered all my SED tools and script um, and designed this uh, lamella facade that changes according to the orientation and also to the to the height and in a different yeah, pattern. So it moves along uh, moves along the building. And you have this sawtooth. It's a sawtooth principle. You can you have unobstructed views when you are uh, in front of it, but it will also blocks uh, the direct sun. And from that moment on, I felt a certain liberty to put my opinion on the table. And they also gave me a freedom to apply it, so that was, was nice. Um, after doing it ten tenders for a year, I asked them if I could get a project of my own. And they gave me the chance to become the project architect of a housing project in the south of the Netherlands with 230 dwellings, mixed use for a developer. Uh, I won't go very deep into the design, but what we try to achieve is orienting all the, the dwellings as much as possible towards the sun, even though this is a very high density urban configuration. So what is usually done is that the most expensive uh, dwellings that are facing south have sunlight, they have the nice views, they have everything. And then the, the rental apartments, which are placed in the north and in the west wing, are in the shade of the nicely south facade. So we wanted to twist things around and we shaped the north block in such a way that it gets attractive terraces facing south and adds also quality to the courtyard. So we, we the landscape of the courtyard continues in this vertical uh, rocky wall, stepped south facade, with also fixed uh, planter pots. And we made it public. So usually these, these blocks are closed. You are, when you are a resident, you are allowed to get in, but when you are not, it remains a closed box for you. And we introduce this nice, nice gate. It can go, everyone can go in during the day and at night it's closed. This is one of the later images on how the facade looks like. Um, we did a lot of sun studies, 
or I did a lot of fun studies to show the clients why we shape the mass in a certain way. And they were not so used to, to read this kind of, um, yeah, visualizations. So I had to first explain them what, what, what it actually means, all these colors, if it's because they keep asking, is this good, is this bad, what does it mean? Um, and then by showing different options and, and trying to convince them that we shape the massing in such a way that it will get the most uh, benefit from the sun and also the most comfortable uh, orientation, we were able to convince them and they also would, were, yeah, they would spend some extra money on that. So to minimize uh, heat loss and maximize solar gains, we also optimized the window to flow ratio. We came up with these three modules that are uh, optimized according to the window to flow ratio. And we combine them and flip them all around. And then you get this interesting facade pattern. So with only three modules, we create the entire facade composition and repeat it all over. Um, so this kind of environmental measures as such as window to flow ratio, insulation, that is all well regulated by the Dutch law. But what isn't is minimizing uh, the carbon footprint. So to achieve this, you have to, be, you have to have a very ambitious client who is willing to, for instance, build or construct parts in wood. And this is the struggle that I'm uh, facing now. I'm trying to, to convince them again uh, to go for the sustainable option. Um, so if you have any tips, let me know. This is what I'm, uh, yeah, what I'm doing at the moment. Okay, thank you, Anna Lewis. Thank you. <laughs> and we we might have some tips, yeah. Great. <laughs> okay, well, um, the next presentation is by Kara. Yes. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. Great. So um, I'm Chiara Multari, I'm from Italy, working in uh, uh, RPBW, and uh, I completed my uh, MSc with Anna Luz uh, in uh, 2017. So it has been now almost uh, four years. And um, I would say that I was a fresh graduate when, um, when I joined MSc in 2016. So I actually was supposed to uh, take the mark, but then I decided to shorten my experience at EA. So it was exactly one year. And uh, do you see this at the side? Sorry. Um, yes. Okay. So um, after that, uh, I, uh, after graduation, I immediately uh, started um, applying uh, to architectural companies in London. I wasn't very um, decisive about uh, um, working for a consultancy agency because I got very, very excited during uh, my SED uh, MSc. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, I made my mind uh, to um, keep working uh, um, in uh, the design industry. So uh, deciding to um, keep being an architect. And I joined this uh, uh, small, super small company in, um, in London, but uh, with very high ambition. So um, after one and a half year, I got the opportunity to go back to my home country. And that was uh, uh, a bit unexpected, but um, it was uh, it was a great opportunity, and uh, I didn't <clears throat> I didn't want to lose that um, that opportunity. And I'm now I mean back to Italy. Uh, I've been working for RPBW for the past uh, two years. So since my experience was so different, I'm gonna show you uh, just two projects, which are uh, very emblematic of um, the kind of work experience that. Uh, that I did. So working in a small company was um, a very exciting, very interesting as a fresh graduate because um, 
I got to do a bit of everything, like from uh, from the very beginning, and uh, it was uh, very manageable. <laughs> I mean, the size of the projects we had as a company of uh, eight uh, people, and. Uh, uh, the first project I started working on was uh, um, was the Living Lab and was uh, uh, the size, exactly the size of, uh, of a room. And it was inside of, uh, of the shard designed by Renzo Piano, which is not a coincidence. So um, David Kang Design is uh, a company whose mission is... Um, um, uh, whose mission is uh, improving uh, human well-being through uh, design. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, this is what probably was um, so interesting to me uh, when I joined uh, when I joined the company. Um, the, uh, the whole uh, uh, the whole idea was to uh, uh, to try to measure and improve uh, human well-being through design. So, uh, the two spaces that uh, I first got to design with them were two winter gardens uh, of the Shard, of uh, an office building uh, owned, uh, um, I mean, rented by Mighty, who was uh, the client, who was just moving in into this, um, into uh, their new offices. And uh, um, they asked uh, a design and build company to uh, design the whole floor plate and I uh, asked to design these two small spaces uh, as an experimental project. So it was an, a pilot project that the client want um, to use it as a test to, um, to see how they, can, they could do, I mean, how design could impact uh, on their employees' uh, well-being. So um, uh, the first of the two winter gardens was uh, um, a working space like, exactly four workstations and the other one was uh, um, the regeneration box so a breakout space and uh, um, obviously the the whole floor plate was uh, fully conditioned so we had very small margin to affect the environment uh, uh, I mean at least uh, with the tools that I had just learned during uh, uh, during the SED. So, and this is what how we got um, uh, how we came across to this uh, essay uh, of uh, an architect about um, biophilic design, which is doesn't sound uh, super scientific considered considering the tools that we had just learned, but it was also for me very stimulating and very interesting to see. Uh, other approaches um, because obviously I had all the all the um, I mean more um, let's say scientific toolkit that I got from my MSc but then uh, I, we had a very uh, limited space and limited uh, possibility to um, to play with uh, with um, the physical environment so we started to look at um, how really elements of design can affect uh, uh, can affect people, and uh, uh, we ended up designing this small space following these principles, and uh, uh, so combining uh, elements of design, which would uh, um, make uh, people feel more at ease uh, to improve their mental well-being uh, aside of their uh, physical well-being. So uh, we um, we used uh, biomorphic forms uh, and uh, um, diffuse dynamic lights that were uh, connected to a circadian uh, clock. So the light was changing uh, during the day to uh, foster concentration of people working there. We um, obviously used entirely um, mm, uh, Non VOC emitting materials, so natural material, uh, and embedded a uh, little nature, so plants uh, into uh, into the design. What was I mean interesting about working on this project was not probably just the design part, which was also very fun, but also the uh, pilot project because uh, uh, the, the the client wanted us to um, also to prove that we had uh, um, achieved or 
we wanted to measure how um, people were affected by um, the design uh, of this uh, of this space. So we um, we um, tried to be as scientific as possible. We teamed uh, with uh, um, with the uh, UCL. Um, <clears throat> Master of uh, Engineering and uh, um, sustain basically the Master, which is parallel to us. And this was obviously not our choice, but uh, so the, uh, the um, Sustainable uh, um, Environmental Design of the UCL. And uh, uh, we uh, invited people to take part uh, to uh, the pilot project. So we had people um, sitting uh, and working in this for, uh, workstation for a month uh, and uh, another control group uh, working uh, in uh, another um, space uh, in the main office. And uh, um, we also embedded technology inside of the workstation. So uh, an environmental sensor, um, a light sensor and uh, um, also a carbon sensor. So we got to have the data about uh, the environment uh, and also we submitted people um, a survey that we built uh, together with, uh, uh, with the UCL just to um, basically ask people how they were affected by the environment. And uh, this was a very meticulous project. So I, I would say that um, really interesting, uh, uh, it was a very interesting experience because I got to see all the faces uh, of, uh, um, of the project from design to site, because I also followed the, the site, obviously it was a very short experience, probably uh, six or seven months, but also the um, pilot project. So uh, we, um, conf uh, we confronted both uh, the environmental data with the response of people. And uh, the, um, the feedback of the user were surprisingly good. So uh, people were actually um, feeling very comfortable and relaxed uh, um, and more concentrated and more focused uh, uh, while working uh, um, for this month uh, in the control environment that we designed for them. So um, it was uh, uh, extremely interesting uh, um, to uh, also to have the opportunity to um, and to do a post-occupancy study, which is something that we uh, have been talking a lot um, during the um, about during the MEC, and not often you get the opportunity to to do. And uh, this is uh, uh, the regeneration pod, so the other space uh, that I was talking about, I briefly mentioned. But this is a breakout space, so I'm not going to. Uh, spend a lot of time. And uh, it was also fun uh, to receive a lot of interest from uh, various uh, uh, sources because the, um, the project got published and got uh, some interest also in uh, architectural magazines. And uh, it basically brought me where uh, I am now. I've been working uh, uh, for a number of projects uh, after, after that, but again, a small, uh, small scale, which is uh, appropriate for a small site company. And uh, the fun part is that uh, during the opening of the project, I met my current boss, who brought me to Genova after uh, one year, where um, basically, um, in a company where basically biophilic design uh, is somehow, sounds, Somehow, somehow like a joke is really embedded in uh, Italian culture and I would say in the DNA of this office. This is our office in Genova, so everything is um, really, really uh, nicely designed with nature. So uh, everything is careful, like whatever we do in the office and it's still like very artisanal, uh, the approach we have uh, is design thinking about the mental and physical uh, well-being of people. So we use always natural material as much as we can. One of the main design elements of this office is the light. And uh, the light is extremely important. 
uh, we <coughs> always in, <coughs> try to um, make the built environment to uh, interact with nature. So we always bring nature inside. Uh, and uh, I would say this is probably the first um, uh, firm in Italy that started um, <coughs> a very strong um, Mm, commitment to, to sustainability. So um, moving to the project I've been working for the past uh, two years, um, uh, if the project I presented before was a very small scale, this is a very, very large scale. Uh, and it's an hospital, the first uh, of uh, uh, three twin hospital, who is fine, which is financed by um, a private foundation, but uh, will be donated to the Greek state. And it's located in uh, Komotini, so where you, you see my cursor, uh, right on the border of um, Bulgaria. And it's not uh, clearly a very fancy location, but uh, the, it's an interesting choice to build such an advanced uh, um, uh, hospital in a place uh, that is so remote uh, and uh, um, somehow almost disappear in the geographic map. So it's a rural place. And uh, uh, the other two hospitals are in Thessaloniki, which is one of the main cities. Uh, and uh, the other is in uh, Sparty. Um, as I was saying, the, um, <clears throat> the site is uh, um, uh, an open field. The, the area is uh, quite rural. and hospital itself uh, is uh, uh, about one kilometer away from the closest city, uh, which is Komotini. And uh, the, the two other hospitals uh, of Thessaloniki and Sparty are also in a rural area, which was a specific choice from, uh, from the office because uh, um, one of the concepts of the project is uh, to uh, bring back basically the uh, healing process close um, to nature. So um, in uh, also in, in the Greek uh, culture, uh, ancient Greek culture, hospitals were places uh, that um, were completely immersed uh, in nature. And also um, I would say to the postmodern uh, postmodernism, um, before hospitals were in uh, city centers, uh, um, they used to be places uh, um, as much as possible surrounded by nature because it's pretty proved uh, that um, the presence uh, of, uh, uh, of trees and clean hair and uh, a relaxing uh, um, view helps people uh, in the healing process. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, not just uh, uh, a lot of uh, nice words, but uh, this is the ambition is really high with this hospital because it, it uh, aims to be the first uh, net carbon zero hospital in the world. So um, we uh, are working really, really hard to uh, make it possible. Uh, um, hospitals are an extremely energy demanding uh, typology of buildings. Uh, by nature, not just because uh, um, they are huge structures, but uh, because they have a lot of machinery that has to be on uh, uh, 124 hours a day and there are hundreds of people working in it and uh, nothing can go wrong. So there, are, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, energy that is required to, uh, to run an hospital. As you can see, the canopy uh, of, uh, of these two um, building hospital is uh, um, covered by a uh, PV field, which produces uh, about 1.6 megawatts uh, of power. Uh, we are currently studying uh, all the details uh, and we're not even selecting the final uh, uh, model panel because the market is going too fast to be able to uh, pick products right now. So we are looking at all the different options uh, that uh, the market can offer with the idea in mind that uh, when the hospital will be on site, so in uh, three years, we will have uh, um, probably even more efficient panels uh, than the ones we have right now. So the market is going really, really fast. Uh, 
uh, obviously the uh, photovoltaic field and uh, the uh, geothermal power, which is the other main source of energy of, uh, of the hospital, cannot fully uh, supply at the energy demand of the hospital, but um, it will be, there will be only, a, um, if I'm not wrong, 18% of energy that the hospital will require to be fully um, in, uh, in operation, but it will be um, offset by the decarbonization of the grid, which is uh, for, uh, forecast in 2050 in, uh, in Greece. So this is uh, uh, the, uh, the site and uh, <clears throat> it's clear, I mean, it's relationship with nature. There are 1,200 trees which are replanted around, uh, around the building. Uh, and uh, the, the site itself is huge, it's 400 by 200 uh, uh, meters. Um, and uh, uh, in, in this park, uh, we will also have uh, healing gardens. So uh, we are collaborating with uh, a great team of landscape designers who are working on, uh, um, uh, exp uh, on, on uh, these healing gardens, which offer experiential uh, uh, opportunity uh, for, uh, for the patients. Um, the concept of the, of the hospital itself is pretty simple and uh, for this reason, probably very powerful. So we have uh, photovoltaic power uh, on, uh, on top and uh, uh, the structure is uh, uh, almost entirely in timber. And we have ge geothermal power um, from, uh, from the ground. And uh, the system is uh, uh, providing uh, 1.2 megawatts of power. So it's an extensive field. This is a recap of all uh, the um, uh, sustainable, uh, the, um, yeah, the sustainability strategy. Uh, obviously, we are supported by uh, engineers, uh, engineers uh, and uh, a little consultancy agency. Unfortunately, the budget didn't allow us to have uh, an environmental uh, um, consultant for the three projects, but uh, this gave me also the opportunity to be more involved uh, in uh, um, in the process uh, of uh, supervising uh, uh, what we're doing. So obviously I'm still working 100% uh, as a designer. So I'm working on the design of the building, but I'm also supervising uh, the um, lead certification process. So um, the target for us is the lead platinum, which is again, very, very ambitious for this typology of buildings. Uh, and uh, um, it seems that it's definitely achievable uh, and uh, we are currently in construction documents. So we are producing uh, all the uh, documentation also for the, um, uh, the lead certification. Lead certification uh, is not something that we um, as SED X students uh, uh, consider as uh, a proof of uh, um, the re real sustainability of the building, but um, working on it, I can uh, uh, I can uh, confirm that all the um, passive design strategies were um, like really uh, rigorously applied in uh, uh, in the design of the hospital. So here there is a brief recap of um, what I've been I've been saying. So. Uh, uh, 1,220 trees replanted, which are basically an offset for the uh, trees that we are cutting uh, for, for the structure. Healing gardens, uh, uh, based on the concept of the Haitian Greek uh, Asclepian, so uh, improving uh, the healing process of uh, patients. And we're using uh, um, glue lamb uh, for, for the structure and uh, um, uh, CLT for, uh, for the slabs. Uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, near zero carbon because uh, the, um, the building is fully electric, electric, so there is no natural gas involved, but still uh, there will be uh, uh, mm, 
an 18% of energy needed from the grid, which hopefully will be uh, very soon uh, in, in the timeline, in the time frame of uh, 30 years uh, decarbonized completely. And uh, it's, uh, um, it's future ready because uh, there is, uh, as I was saying, no need for natural gas. So uh, the, I will talk about a little about the, um, the section of the building, so the structure of the building. We have clinical departments uh, at the very bottom, so uh, and which are protected also by this uh, uh, refill of soil to protect both from, uh, um, from uh, the height of people and uh, um, from uh, from the noise because we have uh, operating theaters uh, on uh, on this side, but at the same time the slope is gentle enough to allow um, the uh, sun to come in uh, all year round. The um, we have uh, the most uh, transparent uh, and uh, for this reason uh, very public uh, functions uh, at um, level one. Uh, but uh, uh, despite the fact that it's entirely glazed, so this section of the building uh, is protected by overhangs. And finally, we have impatient wards, so which are basically flo floating. Uh, um, the idea is that they are flying uh, around, uh, surrounded by trees. So where people are actually spending uh, their um, um, <clears throat> uh, impatient time uh, um, in the process of healing. Uh, transparency of visual connection again, so the upper part uh, and the lower part uh, of, uh, of the building uh, is pretty opaque. Obviously we have windows, but we have curtain walls, uh, so an entirely fully glazed uh, uh, volume uh, on both buildings at level one, but still protected by uh, overhangs. And uh, this is a typical section uh, of, uh, of the building. Uh, as I was saying, uh, as, and the, <clears throat> our way of working in our PBW is still very uh, crafty, like very uh, workshop people draw by hand uh, all the time. And this is why at the beginning we have uh, a lot of uh, hand drawings, uh, but the, um, the entire hospital is uh, um, entirely built uh, build in, um, um, in, uh, in Revit, so uh, it's uh, an extremely advanced model. I'm currently working with, um, with uh, the um, building, um, the B manager. Uh, to um, advance, uh, I mean, also the level of uh, detail uh, inside of the of the rabbit model, also to be able to manage uh, in the future the uh, the hospital through the model, which is something that uh, so in a in a post uh, uh, construction phase the model will still be used for operation and to understand also energy consumption. Um, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, the um, structure of the um, upper part of the building uh, is entirely in wood. We have concrete uh, only in the lower part where the weight uh, of the machinery, so MRI, uh, all the operating theaters, uh, uh, suites, uh, is impossible to um, be managed with wood. And uh, just a look at, um, at the plants. So this is uh, level one, as you can see, it's all transparent around, but the living space, so the outpatients uh, uh, rooms are um, protected uh, um, from, the, from the corridors. So there is uh, another, um, another layer of protection from, from the sun, but the building is still like very, very transparent uh, at, this, at this level. And this is level two, where all the words, uh, so all the inpatient rooms uh, are. And uh, finally, level zero, which is uh, the real uh, heart of the, of the hospital. So all the clinical departments are here. Uh, operating theaters, uh, ICU, um, a lot of boring stuff, but uh, it was extremely, um, it is also extremely interesting working uh, in healthcare. And uh, as you can imagine, this year was <laughs> particularly intense, the work we had to do. So we had to resign, redesign part of the building to 
uh, make it uh, um, pandemic ready in, uh, in case of uh, future uh, experiences like the one we lived this year. Hopefully not, but it's good practice to learn. And uh, we have, uh, as I was saying, uh, operating tiers uh, with natural light, which is a, an amazing uh, feature that is not, um, not many hospitals can uh, actually um, uh, can have. It's very uncommon to see uh, an operating theater with natural light. And um, <clears throat> obviously we are uh, doing a lot of energy modeling, uh, not ourselves, but uh, the consultants uh, uh, who are working with us. And I'm um, as a, um, the only person who has this uh, um, Mm, this uh, knowledge I'm supervising the process. So we're testing, uh, um, glazing uh, G, uh, G value, things that we've been doing a lot during uh, our, um, our SED courses. So testing the impact uh, on the energy consumption of uh, blinds, uh, internal blinds uh, uh, versus uh, exterior blinds. Uh, um, there is a lot. Uh, uh, of um, reiteration uh, that uh, we're doing to optimize uh, the efficiency of the building. And uh, um, I mean, I was lucky enough also to do some uh, personal work on this, even if uh, the project, uh, as you can imagine, is run by a lot of people. Uh, so I, I got to study uh, a little more in detail the light inside of the intensive care unit, which is a very delicate uh, department. So I was uh, I've been doing studies for the um, <clears throat> lighting, uh, lighting analysis uh, <clears throat> for, uh, uh, for the ICU department. So just showing where, where the problems are and helping the team to get to an optimum uh, uh, level of uh, lighting of daylight inside of the space. And I also got to do renders because uh, in this in this office you basically end up doing uh, really everything, and uh, and this is it. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation. Thank you, Kara. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we we move on. Um, next presentation, Rawan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Rowan Kudrosi. I, I graduated, uh, everybody can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I graduated from SED in 2013 with an MSc. Uh, I'm going to take you through a journey uh, of struggle, I would say, in the Middle East, trying to implement some sustainability, a bit about my dissertation and some of the work I worked on in my hometown. Uh, this is Amman, this is where I live, this is home. Uh, at, at the time for my dissertation, I had to pick a topic to look for the most vernacular uh, architecture found in this area. And I didn't want to do the city, so I chose to go to what is known as the Valley of the Moon, uh, Wadi Rum, uh, what they call it in movies, the real life desert that plays Mars and distant planets, to actually look for the nomadic life and the Bedouins that they live in the desert. So at some point in 2013, I was somewhere over there uh, trying to do my field work. A bit of context, uh, Wadi Rum is to the south of Jordan. Over here, this is Amman. It's a desert region. Um, at some point in 2011, uh, um, uh, Wadi Rum was identified as a UNESCO World Heritage. And of course, this was reflected on the nomadic life and Bedouins had to start settling into homes and working more into the tourism in this industry. Uh, during the dissertation and the research and the fieldwork, I, I got an access to a, a semi-nomadic family who used to spend the time in, a, in her Bedouin tent uh, 
uh, during the spring and the and the summer uh, called Um Umar. Uh, it was a pure it was a pure uh, fascinating experience for me uh, because at the end of the day, in the middle of the desert, it's super hot. Yet it was spring. Temperatures was around 32. Yet I could do with my spot measurement uh, an 18k difference in the surface temperatures. The, it's oriented towards the south. A big opening, uh, well cross ventilated. Very pleasant sitting under uh, this what we would think uh, modern people as a, a piece of cloth, but in reality, this is a home to them. I think uh, coming out of from the course, I could understand with my work and field work how important the uh, occupant of a house is. And this is how we can learn more about the building. I think Bedouins are one of the most connected inhabitants with their environment, uh, how they actually migrate and move their kitchens inside and outside, uh, how they move their walls and they get them close to get the heat and they move them away to to make it more cool, of course, and the responsive material, which is made of goat hair, that causes the stratification effect, keeping it as uh, as pleasant as possible under, under the Bedouin tent. Of course, I think the most thing that impressed me, actually, I took those pictures when the wind was as strong as six meters per, per second, the wind speed, uh, the structure actually swayed with the wind and it could handle such a wind that made it as pleasant as possible. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, them uh, shifting into this uh, modern life of living they imitated exactly the Bedouin tent, they, yet they kept even the circulation external where you get out of the room, move through this co red corridor and back into the other room. And of course, this grew with the development of tourism over there, having this, uh, what they call a sala, what we call as a corridor in our modern life, but they call it the heart of the, heart of the house, which is the family room. Um, Going into the, the village, I could see that the Bedouins did not want to settle, really. They wanted to keep the tent part of their work and uh, part of their life, sorry. And going into the last single house that was free running, no air conditioning installed, I could trace the... I could trace exactly this family room or corridor. It was the most pleasant, I would say here. It was more pleasant because of the installation of the fan. Um, because they have their opening to the north, they get this uh, cool, uh, cool, nice breeze. Um, and to actually emphasize on this, it's funny enough, this family actually, while I had my data logger set over there, the family moved their TV and they actually slept in this tiny corridor being, being the most pleasant room to be in. Uh, so how they, uh, they say they have the saying they say it's a culture without borders and this is exactly was the outcome that i came up with i want to keep this nomadic culture and i want to create this adaptive bedouin house where i could uh, re-emphasize on this family room or a buffer space have this light structure heavyweight uh, uh, um, uh, implementation within the same house trying to keep and preserve this culture um, this is basically my dissertation and as i as i mentioned i went back home afterwards after graduating i got married to my boyfriend. I had the typical Arabic big wedding. Uh, I got an offer at Dar al Handasay, part of Dar Group, uh, a big office in Amman, had the potential to actually maybe do some sustainability. I was hoping. I got into the team working on one of the five big projects, uh, five big hospitals in Riyadh. I used to work on the Neuroscience Trauma Care Center. Uh, coming from the masters, all filled up with idea, with the positivity and uh, the, the energy of change. I couldn't believe my eyes. Such a building, this much of glazing in Riyadh, Oh my God, this hospital in the middle of this extreme weather, I, I really wanted to quit. And uh, I, I, I stayed there. Luckily, one day I was walking through uh, the, the office and they told me the guy in the meeting room, he's from the sustainability group from London office. I just pitched, I went in, ran into him, had the elevator pitch, three minutes. I told him who I am, what I've done, my master's degree. I could actually make a noise. And uh, he came up to me after a month of negotiation that I really want to shift. I don't want to be who, uh, a person who works on such architecture. So he, he, he created the strategic plan and he introduced it to the directors and he decided to create this structure of these different offices in different countries. There's, a, there's this uh, administrator or coordinator under the sustainability unit with the leadership team in London. Uh, I was supposed to be uh, this person under this. I would tell you in such an country with the politics, this never happened. Uh, however, with the noise that I caused in, within the office, a, a colleague of mine was working on the Shamia expansion 
another team uh, in Mecca and he told me, can you actually within a week just give me some feedback on the existing design that we're working on? Uh, basically, it's this zone. It's the uh, the evolution and the toilet zone with the shuttle area. I Honestly, uh, as soon as I saw it, with one week, I have to do the modeling. I know nothing about the project. I, I actually worked on that. Uh, I, I, I took it home, which is uh, which was not very uh, okay with the company. Yet I did. I, I asked them with those voids. They have these huge voids uh, openings. I told them you have to close those voids. You have to shade them. You can't keep them as open. And I and I showed him that during the mild period, the mild period, this is this is causing extreme solar gain. This, this is a burn. This is not possible. You can't do this in Mecca. And the higher levels, they had these huge openings uh, with this transparency and connection with the view. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. This is possible. But I kept on emphasizing shade, 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 shade. And uh, so they decided, OK, we'll shade. These umbrellas was, were actually used uh, within, the same, uh, with, within the same project in the phase one in Mecca done by, the, by a German office, the Piazza umbrellas. So I said, Okay, so I did the simulation, showed them that this actually helped. Yes, it did. But why don't you like delete the, the, the beginning of the problem? Why did you create such voids? I'm speaking about 15 meters, 20 meters length and width. It's, it's, it's massive. And really, really, when you go back to vernacular, and this is what we learned in, uh, in the course, Add the mashrabiya, have these treatments, have some shading, have these pier slabs, you have the money. And the uh, movable over, you reduce the size, there's so much that can be implemented. I don't know what happened, honestly. I was shifted from that project. But looking on the positive side, I worked with another, uh, with another colleague of mine. He was working on one of the plots. It's a huge compound for the government agency in Riyadh. It was an office building. He said, the design can't change. What can you do? So I told him, this is an office building. You have your afternoon sun. The offices are at the office. It's a full glazing west-facing facade. You have, the, you have the glare with the offices. This is, this is really bad. You need to shade. So... Basically, again, looking at such a climate, I'm telling him 45, 48 degrees, you have, high, this is an overheated period, you can't do this. They had fixed louvers. I was like, we had the negotiation back, back and forth, tilt the louvers, block the sun, shade, please shade, just, the t just for that time. I did the illuminance images, showing him the glare, showing him the lux that is happening, Honestly and sadly, I would say it was a negotiation over the looks and aesthetics. This is, ah, it's, it's too much of a block. And then they had, uh, with the negotiation, I could only actually convince them with having more louvers on these floors. Yet this, I couldn't. They wanted to have this light and uh, heavy, like light and heavy kind of louvers. But we agreed to actually extend the concrete structure to actually to bit to help a bit with the shading, self shading by the building. I would say I won a small win for them to tilt the louvers. I had, I have to say, I won when I actually negotiated, and. Uh, looking on a positive uh, aspect, while I was at Dar, I got the chance to actually publish part of my dissertation with Paula in Bologna, coming back, recharged, believing in what I've studied, I actually quit. And I established an uh, arc lab, a research lab with my colleague, uh, Karma Gammo. And uh, I got the chance to start work, uh, working with the American University of Madaba as an industrial lecturer. Uh, these are the courses that I'm actually teaching. Um, I have to say every single thing I learned in the course actually is, is part of me that I find myself in terms of material, embodied energy, the way we look at architecture, even for foundation year students. Uh, this was a graphic designer who actually looked at wires differently to design Design, I see sustainability in me in everything that I was actually teaching. And, uh, and most importantly, I remember the London Walk. It changed me how I look at the microclimate and whatever is happening. We usually design thinking the building is just freestanding, nothing around it, what's happening within. These are a couple of students in foundation year that I taught them they were a, a group of interior designers, architects, and graphic designers. Honestly, it's a beautiful uh, impact I could have on the students, how even the signage and every single line you draw, it's not exactly what you see on paper. You really need to understand what is happening. Uh, everything changes on in reality and every even the thickness of the wall, whatever you're drawing, the size of the windows, the impact is different. You have to observe more. 
And this is mainly what I, I kept on emphasizing in this uh, course. Um, moving on to part of the research uh, that I've, I've been working with on our, uh, with our club, uh, this is a, a massive uh, a massive university complex. It's the German Jordanian University in Jordan. It's one of the prestigious universities in Jordan that uh, that there was a decision taken about it. It will be the first sealed environment, fully air conditioned university in Jordan. Uh, the concept done by the architect was to create those two forms, uh, you know, the two cultures, the Jordanian and the German connected with this bridge. You see this uh, form uh, being repeated here and there. Uh, we got an access to the project, main, to the main building C. Uh, we did our field work, me and my my colleague with Art Lab, and uh, starting with the observation around the the building, uh, the designer thought that students will be sitting in, in in the interior spaces, enjoying the air conditioned rooms. The, the spaces outdoor were not made for the user yet. You see the students all over the place that it's actually causing them issues with the noise because they did not assume people will use the outdoor spaces in terms of the noise uh, caused for the classrooms at the ground floor. And this is one of the most, I think, funny pictures that shows how the, the person wants to see, stay out, outside. Uh, this is, the people are following the shade line, really. They're just moving in with the time, moving in until the last resort. Even although the temperature is around 32, they don't mind it. Everybody wants to stay outside. And uh, an overview from the top. This is what, what happens. They move to the other side when it's more shaded. People want to move. Moving into the building, it's a fully sealed environment. People are opening the windows, the controller are broken, trying to control the temperature, it's too cold for them, they need some fresh air, nothing is happening. So on a typical day when we used to do our field work, this is what we see. We see the lights are always on, windows are open, the air conditioning is on all the time, yet it's quite pleasant because of the coupling with the outdoor uh, waste of energy. However, I, I want to move in just to show you some of the field work we've done. Looking at this north facing uh, classroom, C31. Uh, of course, the irregular distribution of the windows that was part of the dynamic culture between the Germans and the Jordanians. This was the, uh, the message. We would think with such a high window to floor ratio, we will have good uh, daylight, good natural light, well lit classroom. Unfortunately, it's really shocking, less than 100 lux in the distribution within the classrooms. Moving on to the south facing, we have a 12.8 as a window to floor ratio, still a good uh, window to floor ratio, yet unfortunately we couldn't even reach 100 lux in the in the lux distribution within the classroom. Honestly, this is just because when the design was done, the decision on the windows was, was taken by the mechanical engineers, ne never the architect involved, uh, and, uh, and it's never reflected how the user would interact with such a full reflective high, high values that actually affected the buildings or the whole buildings where the lights are always turned on. Moving on the data loggers, I think this is one of the most interesting graphs uh, I've seen uh, just to prove the point. Uh, you could see that the ACs are always turned on around seven and turned off around 334. You see this massive dip, yet you see this fluctuation, which is because Basically, the students are just opening the windows and coupling with the outdoor, just trying to make it warmer, as comfortable as possible. And, uh, uh, and here, the data loggers, you could see the smooth curves around uh, on a Thursday, and this is because there was no, cla no classes. However, I want to zoom in. Uh, basically, on a, and you see the two key difference between the south facing and the north facing, the, pro the building is actually properly uh, well insulated, I would say, I mean, uh, relatively uh, to buildings in Jordan. And you could see uh, how actually the students opening the windows and doors, they're making the temperature as close as what it is when it's free running over the weekend. And uh, they're okay if the temperature was around, for example, uh, 24 degrees with air conditioning on, students are actually opening the windows and they don't mind the 27 with the nice breeze coming in from the windows. This, uh, this finding that we had, we had a big presentation with the, with the president of the university, with the Columbia Global Center, and we had a huge QA. At the end of the presentation, I just laughed and I said, 
turn off the mechanical system, leave it as a free running building and you'll be impressed amount of consumption of energy, the reduction and how happy the students will be. On, unfortunately, nothing happened. But looking on a positive side, I got to publish part of my work from this research in the PLEA conference in Edinburgh. Moving on to the last uh, a small part of this, another research that we're, we've worked on with the Center for the Study of the Built Environment in Jordan. Uh, in Jordan, we have a major, major issue where public schools in Jordan are not insulated buildings, no heating installed, yet uh, it really drop that uh, in the north, the temperature drops to zero and below zero, and it's quite unbearable to students. That actually a royal initiative, the USAID and another initiative were involved trying to figure out what to do. Uh, uh, just to zoom in a bit, this is a typical uh, a public school that we got access to in Salhoub in Salt up in the north. This is a typical C-shaped, yet it's one of the uh, schools that got an extension, which is this extension by the USAID. Typical, uh, typical repetition of the same buildings, no additions, no involvement of any passive strategies, I would say, to help the building. However, uh, what I'd like to share today with you, this is a typical scene in the school. Uh, of course, after what happened in Syria, we could see the number of students uh, very high. We have shifts at night. We have 32 students on average in a classroom. And the temperature on this was a warm day in, in winter. It, the temperatures were 21, the indoor were around 19. But I think uh, afterwards, the, the main issue with the classrooms, it was the how stuffy it was and the relative the high relative humidity. This image here shows the typical uh, gasoline movable heaters that were used. Uh, I just want to show you what is very interesting, uh, how the, it's all about the inhabitant uh, himself. Uh, the first session starts in eight. You see the relative humidity is quite high within the classroom. It's not ventilated at all at night uh, to lose this relative humidity. However, the first, uh, there's 30 students in the classroom after the first session, two degree increase, and one window is open. The second class uh, starts and the heater is on. Uh, uh, with the POE, of course, post occupancy evaluation, everybody was saying it was cold. The heater was on one degree increase. The second, the third uh, session, one degree Celsius increased. They got a 30 minute break. The gasoline heater is still on a drop, a tiny drop in the temperature. And you see the drop in the relative humidity. Students left the classroom. And then again, they, they said that it is warm post occupancy evaluation. So they are telling us in the POE that they are, it's actually warm. In reality, temperature was 17 internally, but outdoor it was 16, it's a one degree. It's all psychological. And after the two classes and the three classes, we see an increase of one degree and a half. Uh, I would say at the end, what we realized that to them, it's a placebo effect. We just not, we need the heater there. We open the windows, it's stuffy. Actually, the heaters are the students themselves. And here, what we wanted to do actually to impose and try to interact with the initiatives, trying to put their money in the right place. Let's work on the passive strategies. Let's add some sun spaces, those corridors, their circulation, help the buildings that's insulate. Let's minimize the window to floor ratio. Honestly, everything remains on paper till now. Uh, moving on with after after the submission of this uh, research uh, in January 2019, Simos here is my daughter, and you could see the influence. I couldn't I couldn't keep her. It's a terrible tools. She's gonna ruin the presentation. You could see the influence I have on her by mistake. She's always around with me on site wherever we are. Even when she had to go, she went for a construction worker. Uh, anyways, and. Uh, this is Naya. She's two now. And uh, afterwards, I got on. I took her off for a maternity. I took a maternity leave. Wanted to come back, and do I really wanted to work on this research to start working on this in Jordan. Uh, some few homes remain with this adaptable wooden shading get uh, add to that function a shutter and now right now everything is moving into those aluminum automated kind of shutter i would say not serving the purpose i really wanted to compare and hopefully hopefully i could represent this and work with an aluminum company reintroduce this adaptability and movability of these shutters but unfortunately COVID started and i couldn't get access into the homes and hopefully soon i'll go back to this uh, honestly i would like i know my presentation seems more of a negative a struggle. It's all the field work showing really, really uh, the field work how important to is to show 
uh, to show what do you call it the policies and leaders and main uh, designers that there should be a change i i would quote uh, norman foster when he said you have to be an optimist if you're an architect i would say a, a sustainability or a specialist in sustainability double triple the power of that uh, at least living in the middle east but i still believe there should be a door tiny change at some point when policies start changing and the approach i think there's so much possibility and uh, chance for a change in such countries like our countries and thank you i'd like to end this with this quote thank you Rowan. with you around i think I'm, I'm i'm almost sure there will be change thank you okay um we move to the um last presentation for today with uh, pierre luigi hello i'm gonna share Can you see it well? Yes. Okay. Hello, my name is uh, Pierluigi Turco. I am uh, an ex SCD from uh, 2015. Today, I'm going to show you a project uh, uh, that I've really worked a lot in, in as a lead designer in SOM. I'm working at SOM uh, since, uh, I would say, since graduation, but I had uh, a break in the middle. Uh, but just, uh, but first I would like to talk a little bit about my experience. So I come from uh, Palermo. There is a city in the south of Italy in Sicily. And uh, I had a few experience around Europe with my studies, but I would say that uh, the big change happened when I went to London to the SED course. And um, it was tough, but it was also a lot of fun. This is uh, an image uh, uh, of a uh, funny moment uh, from uh, trip in Lisbon. Um, I can assure even pa uh, Paula was happy in this moment. So I, I post another image just to be, <laughs> to, to testify that. Um, it was tough. I had the opportunity to work. Uh, uh, this is my partner in crime, Andrea, which is another SCD uh, with which I, uh, with whom I, I keep working. I actually, straight after the AEA, we managed to win a competition for a school in Palermo, in my city, and uh, slowly we are building it. We are now at the moment of, um, of basically starting the, the design after so, so much time. But uh, um, uh, on a let's say this is on a separate page because my uh, career now is uh, in SOM. And um, uh, I started working on SM straight after, I would say, the, the SED course. It was quite easy uh, to find a job with, the, with the, I would say, with that preparation. And uh, I worked for SM uh, the first three years, uh, and I would say I became, uh, in a way, a more mature architect. But then after a while, I decided to have a break. And uh, after a while, I moved to Kuwait City, where I worked for a, an important local company called uh, PACE, Pan Arab Consulting Engineering, which was uh, um, it, which was, it's an historical company in Kuwait and in the Middle East, and it has worked with uh, many famous practices uh, as a local architect for uh, for the area. Um, and then I, I actually, uh, in this presentation, I want to talk how SED has influenced my approach to architecture. And um, I remember when I did, uh, I don't know if it's still like this, but the module were essentially two, what can building tell us? And then uh, what, we, what can we tell back? And uh, with the knowledge I got in uh, SED, I start looking at some building that were um, SOM design in the Middle East, some more successful, some other less successful. But in a way, I was proud to see that some of them, they were sharing uh, a lot of intention in a way that are the base of the SCD. Uh, I just going through some of them, for example, this is Alamra Tower. It tries to mediate between the need of a transparent glass office tower, uh, but trying to, in a way, orient the building in a way that the south orientation is kind of more screened, more opaque. This is my favorite building also from SED, from uh, SOM uh, in Riyadh. It's the National Commercial Bank. 
and you can see here there is a strong uh, a strong i would say statement uh, and uh, a clear uh, kind of strategy in trying to screen uh, the office from the sun with this uh, uh, um, opaque facade and this atria that run around the building uh, but also i would say even a much simpler building like this one uh, which is not very famous but it was just next to my office in kuwait uh, by the way, the one you see on the background is also another uh, swam building from, I think it was a really good time for the firm. Um, simple building, but in a way with a strong statement, uh, for example, this one is placing the two core on the east and west side, and then uh, he has a gla completely glazed facade on the north side, and then the south, which is what I was looking from the building on the right where I was working, it's completely very well shaded with the horizontal deep uh, uh, element. Um, so basically this Kuwait experience gave me the opportunity basically to, to understand what some building could be able to do in the Middle East because I didn't have any experience of what the Middle East was and but also to experience of course the culture and, uh, and the place. Um, another building, this maybe could very well link to the Rawan uh, presentation about uh, uh, the Bedouin culture and, uh, and the tent. This is another building from SOM in the, it's the Ash Terminal again in Saudi Arabia. And uh, this is uh, conceived as a sequence of, uh, of tent, uh, the original nomad population were using. Uh, but it transformed that into a terminal, into an airport. And it, there is a link between the nomad uh, culture and the nom nomadic culture of the travelers in a way. Uh, actually, it's a really interesting building because I'm working recently also on different airports and they kind of uh, um, extend and kind of take advantage of the opportunity to stay outside. And actually this was very valuable strategies that in time of COVID uh, results very successful. So after Kuwait, I went back uh, uh, to London and I was hired back uh, by my boss in SOM as a design associate. So I took all this knowledge I get uh, applying the clinical eye that SED gave to me. And I went back to, to London and to SOM where I would say many projects are based in the Middle East. Uh, so I had the opportunity to work straight after on a project uh, as a lead designer in Jeddah. And uh, it's a, an hotel project is the one that I'm gonna show to you. So uh, this project is located in the Odur Bay and uh, it's basically uh, not far from the Jeddah city center. The Obur Bay is the one you see on the top uh, in this bay. And uh, it's also very close to the King Abdulaziz International Airport, but also in front of one of probably the main symbol of uh, capitalist architecture, <laughs> the Jeddah Tower that is uh, supposed to be, is going to be probably the tallest building in the world, one kilometer high. And um, the site we had was quite constrained in a way because it was in the middle of two, of two highway. Uh, so there was a need to isolate from the noise and everything. But at the same time, we had a good opportunity to kind of facing both the north, uh, which is probably the best orientation and uh, the view of the, of the sea. So what's interesting was that this plot was basically the house of the uh, of the mother uh, of the owner, and he decided to to change it in, into an hotel, and because he had the opportunity to develop and make money out of it, um, and this is the view from uh, from from that site. But actually, when you see on the ground floor, you see there is a lot of noise and things coming. So, of course, uh, the. The, every project comes with different challenge and it's always very challenging to integrate all the notion we have of sustainability, uh, sustainability um, to um, a, a design that is usually aimed to be commercial. <clears throat> so there are many factors that were kind of uh, uh, playing uh, playing the game and but the, the, we, we try what I try to do is always to, 
create a, a small, uh, let's say, palette of things that will need to be included in the design. And these were all, of course, all ingredient for a, a very opulent resort. Um, the design vision was uh, something that, uh, in a way, for me, was a great opportunity because uh, it was an area where exactly at the moment there is nothing going on. So the question was, so how do you operate in a context uh, where you don't have actually much to relate to? And um, in that case, of course, a vernacular example, both uh, sim sim uh, for symbolism, but also for uh, properties, were kind of uh, the base. So what this building can tell us, not in terms only of uh, performance, but also uh, in terms of uh, symbolism. And so I try to collect a kind of element uh, on, in the region, in the area, but also far from it, like Palazzo della Civiltà e Lavoro in Rome. And then as in all the, all the office, you usually you go through a series of iteration until you, your boss pick the one that he likes. And in this case, there was a kind of a easy win in the central option because it was containing a lot of things that were working well in terms of context, uh, but also in terms of uh, environment. And the idea basically went to the to this central option which is symbolically very strong, but at the same time as the other building that uh, uh, I showed in, uh, in the introduction, uh, he has a strong statement, something that, um, that kind of, it's clear uh, basically for who, who see the building. And this thing is, uh, we probably need to shield ourselves to the surroundings and create this kind of uh, very protected area in the middle that can, allow us to spy the sea, but at the same time to be protected from the harsh climate. Um, so the architectural resolution again went through some principle and I would say that this principle are, came to me from SCD because understand the culture is not only about understand, I would say uh, the tools to understand the, the physics and the climate are super important, but these are ingredients that probably let us understand a little bit further uh, what's the culture and uh, why the architecture in, is in a certain way. So I think these three elements, these three themes were extrapolated from uh, uh, the context, either for from the climate, but also from the culture. And so the project was based on the three elements of threshold, the hierarchy of space and the layering of space, which is something really uh, important in the culture of the Middle East. Uh, but also a uh, vernacular example where a tool to always check the design and see if what we were doing was actually in terms of scale of proportion dimension, which is the basic for the architect, something that in a way could fit into the context. So how we can translate that vernacular into something uh, new. And uh, I found it too interesting how the, the Oberoi Hotel in plan was in a way trying to find a connection with other vernacular uh, example. And uh, starting from the form, but then going also into detail into the part of the building. So, well, massing principle of the building were, were quite simple. First of all, creating this edge around, which is, was something not very easy because the, 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 the density, the site needed to be very dense. Uh, but then LA creating an address from the front, but also that could be uh, directly uh, create a dialogue with the sea. And then elevating the lobby experience up just to shield from the busy ground floor. And then so a sky lobby that could kind of isolate, isolate people and bring them up into the sky. And then open, opening up the view with this open courtyard that was looking toward the sea and creating at the end uh, an extra element on the top that would contain the most prestigious suite, but also the communal, the communal uh, facilities of the hotel. Um, so yeah, the first, the first uh, problem I would say was how to create that notion of threshold. The notion of threshold was uh, very, 
um, difficult because the site was very constrained. However, elements of the vernacular architecture were suggesting a portal as a prob probably the best way to organize that. And you can see already the building, how it's trying to basically uh, screen uh, itself from the surrounding. And the reason were two, one, because uh, we didn't know what uh, was going to happen uh, next to us in the next few years. So you wanted uh, a building that could uh, survive that. Uh, but also, of course, a screening south, east and west direction from uh, the arch sun of, the, of Saudi Arabia. And also the plan started becoming something in a way related to the traditional uh, uh, plan that you could see in uh, caravansary or in uh, mosque, the way the thick wall are organized and the way the layering of the, of the, um, of the different parts. And again, the importance of the procession, the arrival experience and how you could organize that in such a tiny, um, in such a tiny space in a way. Um, this is a harder view of this portal entrance lobby. And then the section as well, I wanted to kind of tr tr section and plan. And we're trying to talk about this layering of public and private space. And there is a gradient of public and private going from the bottom, uh, from the ground floor to the top of the building, because the area on the ground floor is related for, is uh, more a back of house service area. And then your lobby and ballroom is uh, elevated on the upper floor to screen from the from the from the noise. And then, of course, the hotel needed to accommodate a different function, the ballroom, which is something really important uh, in the uh, for the financial viability of uh, the hotel, where a lot of events are taking place. Uh, but also, how we created this elevated lobby to look into the sea. And um, that's the idea when you enter this kind of uh, uh, this threshold and you enter into the lobby, you are immersed in this kind of a very um, protected environment that uh, frame uh, the bay. And then on the top, again, uh, the idea of having uh, uh, the sea view and, uh, and the other, other, other more communal facility. Same thing in the other side of the section was happening from uh, outside to the courtyard. And again, this idea of layering of public and private space um, is, uh, is uh, again translated into this section. And uh, this, is, uh, yeah, this, is, uh, this was uh, something that was really hard to uh, make it happen, but uh, uh, we ended up with we manage it at the end, but the idea was that instead of placing the 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 key, the room outside, and having the corridor inside, as usually happen in a courtyard, we try to invert that. The reason being because we don't know what's going to happen in the neighborhood building, and at the same time, we had an idea of shielding, creating a buffer from the corridor to the basically area uh, inside the, the living space of the of the hotel key. Uh, but then one, once you do that, of course, there were a lot, of, a lot of thinking about privacy and how you can direct view toward a certain direction. Um, and then, of course, this presidential suite would be, of course, at the peak of this, uh, this plan. So this is a view from the corridor where this system of facade, which I'm going to explain later, is creating this uh, Sharabi effect uh, at a bigger scale. And, uh, but at the same time, it gives light to, to the corridor and created this kind of uh, uh, nice uh, light that is filtering through, uh, creating a different experience, I would say. And then again, the hotel key were also organized through a sequence of space, a layering of space going from the bathroom to the middle uh, area for, the, for sleeping to the, then the living part, which is where the living area was located. Okay, simple plan of a key room. And then I think a big part of all of this was uh, how to design a, uh, facade that in a way had to, so in terms of form, plan and section, in a way we were trying to accomplish that uh, 
principle that were uh, intrinsic in the in the culture but then in terms of facade then it was something more difficult and the three elements the three key points we wanted to achieve was solar control but how do you still allow view uh, allow views out which is key for uh, the operator and for the guests but also you achieve uh, the privacy and again, these three elements are probably theme that are the base of the architecture in this region. So the idea was uh, that um, the facade could be created uh, from a simple module that was actually almost uh, a reduction in scale of the whole building in a way. And this module could uh, be adapted to the different uh, uh, orientation according to the typology in order to create a transparent view, but at the same time, uh, allowing daylight and screen from, from the sun. So one element was uh, the one that was directly facing the north, was quite simple, quite more straightforward, always very deep in terms of facade. The other one on the two side were uh, skewed in a way that uh, you were in a way protected and there was a certain privacy and we're looking on the other side of the building, but when you actually turn a little bit to the sea, you had the opportunity of see them quite clearly. And this was just done, um, tested also through through model, 3D model uh, of the different uh, of the different modules, so the central one and the east and west one. And but also it was really helpful to understand how this thing could be in a way built, and how we can even solve the small details like. Uh, when you have the slab, what this is going to look inside. So all these aspects were, were, were kind of uh, um, studied. And again here, of course, a simple solar analysis studies, which I do still, I would say, uh, even if uh, sometimes there is no time for that in the, in the, in the, in the company, because uh, there are dedicated people to do that. But for me, it's always a good test to, to try to see if my design is really performing in a way, and if my assumption are correct. And so these were studies that I quickly done to see the, uh, the access of uh, sun inside the room and if the, the element was working. And this is again, an idea of this layering of different space that, uh, and then what the result from inside the trying to achieve that transparency. Uh, almost, what I find interesting is that when the performance becomes, become in a way the architecture and become the expression even of the interior design. So I think there's something really interesting in that balance. Um, and again, here some quick diagram in the preliminary stage to see how this element could be mounted to maintain a kind of uh, continuous thermal line along the building. And again, other tests that were done to achieve a clean interior design, but also a good performance inside the, the building. So again, uh, Going back to what can building, what can building tell us, and what we can tell back. For me, this project was a kind of exercise, trying to learn what building were trying to, uh, to tell me, and how you can kind of extrapolate this principle, and into a new design with the new, uh, of course, uh, uh, with new objective and new uh, problems that uh, the the. The, uh, today we have, there are not the one we had uh, 30 years ago or 50 years ago. And uh, funny enough, uh, there was a kind of uh, um, simplicity in the design, which was uh, in a way uh, reflected and it also in the past uh, uh, project of SOM, for example, the Yale Library or the National Commer Commercial Black so, uh, Bank. So through very simple geometry, it's easier to achieve a probably good building. And again, also the section was in a way, you could see was trying to get inspiration from the National Commercial Bank, but at the same time, there is this uh, idea of learning from the past and translated that into modern needs. And uh, yeah, this is the 
almost the last slide. So this is uh, the final, uh, let's say, look of the building. I think the most interesting part of the building. But I think what's interesting for me about this building is that uh, uh, I wouldn't have done something like this if it wasn't for ICD. Maybe it would, I would have done something probably less uh, uh, thought. And um, uh, also the principle that uh, I have learned during the master uh, is crazy how they can be applied in any context that we worked on. And, um, and uh, for example, re recently uh, I've worked on uh, um, with the SOM uh, uh, practice, uh, we are presenting a, a moon village uh, in the, at the Biennale Venezia, which is a collaboration between the European Space Agency and the, and the MIT and the SOM. And actually, if you think about this, it's no difference from, from what we have done uh, at the CD Master. It's all about uh, taking the context, analyzing it, and trying to understand what's the best way to act as an architect in it. And I think that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Piero. Thank you.